What's up guys, we're talking about the tension pneumothorax and the odds are you probably haven't treated one and if you have treated one, there's actually a really ch good chance there wasn't even a tension pneumothorax. If you look at this study, out of like the couple of thousand patients that came through this hospital, only 1% had a tension pneumo. So we're going to be discussing what a tension pneumo is, how do we diagnose it according to the evidence and how do we treat it according to the evidence because there is varying methods and thoughts about this. So normal breathing, is passive or not so passive but a negative ventilation so not positive pressure but actually negative pressure because when we breathe in our lungs expand which then drop the pressure in our lungs and then that then forces air to passively move into our lungs so that is negative pressure ventilation if we are ventilating a patient we have positive pressure ventilation that's important because the symptoms or how a tension pneumo develops in a passively breathing versus a actively ventilated patient so assisted versus unassisted breathing patient is very different so we're going to talk about that later so the anatomy the lung has got a space in between it so there's the ribs and there's the actual lung and this is your pleural space so you have your visceral pleura which is on the outside of the lung which is attached to the ribs and then you have your parietal pleura which is then on the actual lung which is then surrounding your blood vessels and nerves and your bronchi a tension pneumo happens when the parietal side of this lung which looks like this, breaks or tears. So then air moves into the parietal. What that does is and then that then causes a pneumothorax. So pneumo is air and thorax is or chest, or thorax, so pneumothorax. When that pressure gets too great, it then starts pushing organs aside, it starts to interfere with things, making breathing difficult, and then the patient has a tension pneumothorax. So a tension pneumothorax is relieved by relieving the tension. But the thing that we're going to be talking about is let's first talk about the, so the signs, and, signs and symptoms. So technically speaking, in paramedic school, we're taught to look for tracheal deviation, um, jugular venous distension. We're taught to listen to um, diminished or absent breath sounds or unilateral one-sided chest movement, where actually these are really rare findings. So the evidence in terms of a unassisted and assisted is very different. So we're going to just tackle the unassisted. So a patient who is not being assisted with their breathing. These patients really present with like universally, they present with chest pain and shortness of breath. These are the two signs that you're always going to find. The tracheal deviation and the jugular distension and the hyperresonance and all that stuff is actually only like sometimes there. And if it appears, it's often very, very late sign. Only very few patients are even going to have JVD or going to have a um, unilateral chest rise or have decreased air entry. Like these are unique findings. With a patient who has assisted ventilation, the universal findings are rapid decrease in saturation and hypertension. And then all the other things about like hyperresonance and all these other signs or JVD and tracheal deviation, they're just so late that they're not actually worthwhile looking at. If we've missed all these signs, we're going to wait for the patient to be in cardio respiratory arrest and now we're trying to decompress a chest. So what are the landmarks? So you have the anterior one, which is your second intercostal midclavicular line above the third rib, or you have your fifth mid axilla anterior. So there have been studies on this and they're saying that our needles are actually not long enough. They've also done studies, if you check this out, that the lateral side has got more tissue and a longer distance to your pleural space than your anterior. And I'll show you the study. I'll link it also below. And then what they've also said, so now we are getting bigger gauge needles. So a needle like this. So you can have a needle like this, and that is a 10 gauge needle, and it is eight centimeters long. That's really big. So we've now gone, okay, let's put in a bigger needle, which you have a higher likelihood of decompressing a chest. But the problem with a bigger needle is that you have a higher likelihood of hitting vital organs. So you might decompress, but you also might go straight through the aorta or the heart. So that's really not that helpful. Stay tuned and I'll tell you a story about where that went wrong at the end. So what should we do? All right. Well, the one thing is, is that in this study, they looked at a whole bunch of patients who came to hospital with a tension pneumothorax. Not one patient with a tension pneumo arrived at hospital who, was, who had unassisted breathing, was in cardiac arrest due to a tension pneumo. 50% of patients who came in with a tension pneumo were in cardiac arrest. So that is really important to realize that when we're going to ventilate someone with a tension pneumo, especially if we're going to perform an RSI on a tension pneumothorax or someone who has potentially a tension pneumothorax. And it's really important to actually understand that these things can take a couple of minutes to like 14 hours to develop. So they're not just something that can happen. Someone gets stabbed and then within an hour they have a tension. It can take hours to develop. And so if we intubate someone later on, 
So how should we treat attention edema? Well, we need to first know how to di diagnose it properly because uh, clearly we're not very good at that. And then we need to know when we're treating it. So if we're gonna put in a needle, if we're gonna go lateral or anterior, we need to be able to assess appropriately to know if it was actually treated. Kind of like when we give dextrose to someone who has a low sugar, we need to reassess the sugar to see if it's come up. In the same way, if we decompress, we need to have a really good evaluation and not just assume that because the needle is in the chest that it has fixed the problem. So if you are going to decompress a tension pneuma, you're going to have the right landmark with the right needle for the right patient. Then you're going to hopefully decompress it safely. Remember to try and avoid vital organs. And when you are going to do multiple decompressions, which is pretty common, you're going to go lateral, not medial. The other option is actually a simple finger thoracostomy. So this is pretty much the same procedure that a doctor does. So they cut the hole, they put their finger in, and then they shove a tube in. A simple finger thoracostomy is just we cut a hole and we put our finger in and we touch the parietal pleura of the lung. So we touch the lung with our fingers, therefore excluding attention humor or treating attention humor. And if they're retention, we just stick our finger back in. This has been proven to be safe and effective in the pre-hospital setting. So hopefully one day soon we'll be moving towards that. So about that story that I was going to tell you about, I was dispatched to a stabbing at a petrol station. And as I got there, there was a paramedic on scene about to do a second anterior chest decompression. His second needle though was going to be going medial. So he was about to pretty much put a needle through the heart and I said, whoa, whoa, let's stop a moment. And so we reassessed the patient, we looked at what was happening and his, he had a sucking chest wound on his back. And so we looked at the three-way side of dressing and they had put a gauze and then a three-way side of dressing on top of the gauze. And so obviously there wasn't a one-way valve function happening. So we removed all that, put on another three-way side dressing, and suddenly the patient could breathe and speak. So there you go. So he didn't actually have a tension humor. He didn't need a needle decompression. He actually just needed his sucking chest wound to be treated properly. So guys, if that was useful, please hit like and subscribe and share this with those who you think would benefit from it. So thank you for your time, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.